Good afternoon, New York, and the rest of our listeners around the globe. My name is June Stoyer, and I'm the host of the Organic View Radio Show. Our podcast is available on iTunes, Zoom, and you can also visit our website at www.theorganicview.com. If you'd like to be on the show or would like to find out about sponsorship opportunities, please contact us at questions at theorganicview.com. Today's show is sponsored by Eden Foods, the most trusted name in certified organic clean food. When you shop online at EdenFoods.com, enter the coupon code ORGVIEW to receive 20% off any regularly priced items, excluding cases. For other promotional offers, please visit TheOrganicView.com's website. And don't forget to check out our contest section. Edible mushrooms are an abundant source of vitamin D and are absolutely delicious. Identifying wild mushrooms is a fascinating and economic skill. Edible mushrooms can be found in a myriad of places. On today's show, New York's very own wild man Steve Brill will be my guest to talk about wild mushrooms and how to identify them, harvest them, store them, and also a few tips on how to prepare them. So I'd like to welcome back to the show, Steve Brill. Good afternoon, Steve, and welcome back to the show. Good afternoon. I'm happy to be back. Steve, can you take a moment and just share with our audience a little bit about yourself and your work? I'm an environmental educator, naturalist, and author specializing in edible wild plants and mushrooms. There is a tremendous abundance of wild food around us. Most people do not know what they are or how to recognize them. Uh, these are very tasty. They are renewable and uh, very, very common. And uh, we're going to talk about the mushrooms today. There are lots of herbs, greens, berries, roots, seaweeds, uh, you name it out there. And I love to show people what these are. I work with the public, with schools, with uh, doctors, herbalists. Uh, once I did a tour with a bunch of lawyers, even. One of them had a farm, and they, uh, they liked nature. Um, even a, a group of dead people, I was hired to do a tour at Greenwood Cemetery, and I especially love working with kids. They're so interested in nature, and they're the future of our environment. So I'll do things uh, in the greater New York area on the weekends for the public, and during the week I might work with a school, a day camp, uh, chefs, and uh, all, all walks of groups from birthday parties to museums. Thank you. Steve, when you're foraging wild edible mushrooms, what equipment should you take with you? There's really not that much you need. Uh, paper bags are important. Uh, mushrooms uh, spoil in plastic uh, that promotes bacterial growth on the mushrooms. So paper bags, a backpack, uh, usual things, water, lunch, um, a, uh, well, do you need tools like a, a trowel? Do you need a pocket knife? A pocket knife. A pocket knife is good. But that's uh, that's about it. Okay. Now, as far as selecting a location, what types of locations are best as far as finding the wild edible mushrooms? Uh, the location where it has been pouring for days in late summer and fall, especially. So under those conditions, you can be in Central Park or the Appalachian Trail, and there will be mushrooms around. Um, if there's a drought, it doesn't really matter where you go. You're not going to find the mushrooms. Uh, some of them grow on the ground. They're decomposers, sort of like me when I play music. Um, others grow on trees. They can be parasites. Others grow among trees where they have symbiotic relationships with the roots. So it's uh, all different kinds of environments and habitats that you look for. But the main thing is tons and tons of rain. And then the season is important. We are recording this in early April, and uh, we have had a lot of rain. And my 11-year-old uh, daughter came home with uh, twigs and sticks full of tree ear mushrooms yesterday. So uh, you can get mushrooms in early spring as well as late summer and fall, but late summer and fall are really the best times. Are there any particular locations such as in the deeper part of a forest or near a lake? 
are there any more specific geographical locations that people who are looking for these edible mushrooms should target? Uh, forests are good, especially oak forests. Maple forests are not, but there's some mushrooms that uh, grow on wood chips and uh, are very delicious. So those you'll get in gardens or parks where they put wood chips on the ground. Uh, it's, as I said, lots of different habitats. Uh, the main thing is you want to go out after there's been lots of pouring rain, and then you'll find mushrooms in a variety of habitats. Mushrooms are most easily understood if you look at what group the mushroom is in. For example, uh, polypores has a lot of edible species and only one poisonous one, and that one is too hard to eat. You have to boil it and make a tea out of it to get yourself sick. All the others are either edible, uh, tough and woody, or uh, worse tasting than school lunch, but you're not going to do yourself any damage. So these mushrooms all grow on uh, trees, living or dead, and they are shaped like shells, and the underside is covered with pores or holes. That's where the spores come out. Uh, mushrooms are the fruit of a fungus. They produce spores, and the spores disseminate into the environment. If they happen to land in the right place, you'll get a new fungus growing. Uh, sort of like an animal, except it uh, secretes its digestive system, its digestive enzymes outside the body rather than within, and uh, digests its food that way. So it's a little more like an animal than it is like a plant. And the mushroom comes up at the right time of the year after the rain and uh, distributes the spores. So the polypore has holes or pores underneath where the spores come out. It grows on living or dead wood, and it's shaped like a shelf rather than an umbrella. The best known of these is the chicken mushroom, also called the chicken of the woods. It is orange colored on top, and depending on the species, it can be either white or yellow underneath. When you break it open, it, ta it looks like chicken meat, and when you cook it, it tastes like chicken. I've made so many, I'm a vegan, and I've made so many delicious chicken recipes with this mushroom, and it can be quite uh, large. In the fall of 2014, I was driving from Westchester to Manhattan to lead a foraging tour along with my then 10-year-old uh, daughter, Violet, and she spotted a 30-pound chicken mushroom from the car. Uh, we had no time to do anything about it, but we came back after the tour, and I collected half of that mushroom. I left the rest. A few days later, I did a private tour with chefs, and I let them have the rest of that mushroom. So I was cooking uh, fried chicken, pan chicken, chicken curry, chicken soup, all kinds of chicken recipes, one big one every day that week, and uh, what I didn't eat then went into the freezer, and it took uh, about two years before I finished the last of it, and a very, very tasty mushroom. And this mushroom, um, as far as current research goes, is uh, very good for the immune system. I went back with chefs later that week and let them have the rest of the mushroom. Now, what do you do with 30 pounds of chicken mushrooms. Well, I made lots of recipes with it. Uh, chicken soup, curry chicken, pan chicken, fried chicken. And once the mushroom is cooked, you can put it in the freezer. And that basically lasted about two years. I have a big standing freezer. And uh, with mushrooms, you sometimes get so many of them that freezing them or drying them uh, is the way to go unless you have a lot of friends with whom to share them. The chicken mushroom doesn't dehydrate well. Some species do, but freezing works really well, especially after you cook them into a recipe. Well, Steve, can you just take a moment and explain your methods for dehydrating the mushrooms as well as if you are to freeze them? What materials do you use to freeze them? Do you wrap them in paper? You know, what types of containers do you use? 
I use uh, freezer containers and I try to find uh, plastic containers that don't have all these uh, harmful chemicals in them. Although certainly something frozen is going to be less chemically uh, reactive than something that is hot. Uh, so they just go into freezer containers. Sometimes I'll freeze things on a cookie sheet first and then put it into freezer containers uh, so that I can defrost individual portions and not have everything stuck together. And when you're dehydrating them, do you wash them? Do you clean the mushrooms before you preserve them? Yes. Or what is the method? Do you use any any type of agent like salt or sugar or anything to preserve the mushrooms? Or do you just put it in a food dehydrator? Do you use an oven? What methods do you recommend? Okay, you have to clean the mushroom. Uh, usually you do that with a moist, uh, stiff brush, like a vegetable brush. Uh, some mushrooms, pieces of grit get ingrained in them, then you have to use a paring knife. There's a delicious polypore called hen of the woods. If you don't get that right away, it's very delicious, and um, you can die of old age removing all the grit if it's old, so try to get those fresh. Um, so you clean the mushroom. Then you slice it, and if you're dehydrating, you just put it in a dehy food dehydrator like, uh, like vegetables. And once it's dehydrated, it goes into a jar. And uh, you keep jars of dehydrated food in dark places like in a kitchen cabinet. Light will slightly degrade food that's dried and stored for a very, very long time. And then when you're ready to use the mushroom, you uh, soak it in stock overnight or soak it in stock that's just off the boil for one hour, uh, drain, drain the stock away, and then you're ready to go. In regards to dehydrating them, how long do they actually keep? At what point should you compost the mushrooms? They'll, is there, they'll, is there... keep, they'll keep for many, many years. Yeah, I've never had to uh, recompost a mushroom once it's dehydrated. When it's dehydrated, the microorganisms cannot grow. They may be there, but they are going to be dormant because they need water. So uh, this stays fresh. Thank you. Steve, when it comes to mushrooms that are dangerous, what are some tips that you could share with our listeners as far as what to strictly avoid? Well, again, it comes down to identification. I mentioned polypores. Those are easy to identify. They have no, no poisonous members. Puffballs, which have spores inside and therefore are sort of globular. Uh, when they're mature, the spores come out like a puff of dust. Um, there are no poisonous true puffballs. Uh, and you want to eat the puffball when it's all white inside, like cream cheese or if you're a vegan like me, like tofu. Uh, there is one poisonous species, instead of being soft and white inside, it starts off white and hard inside, and within a day or two, it starts to turn a purplish black. Uh, that's an earth ball, and that can make you throw up. Steve, can you share with our listeners some tips for mushrooms that should be strictly avoided? I know that it's very confusing. For an expert like you, this is a piece of cake, but for other people, there are certain things that she, they should just strictly avoid. Could you share some of those tips with our listeners? Okay. Firstly, you want to eat mushrooms that you've identified with 100% certainty. There are some groups that are very easy to recognize, like the polypores that I mentioned. Um, morels and puffballs are two other groups that are easy to recognize, and so are chanterelles. You can get in trouble with these groups, but the poisonous counterparts are very, very easy to distinguish from the uh, edible species. You have to be very, very careless and ignore all cautions, sort of like uh, learning how to drive a car and get on the highway and drive in the wrong direction. So those are the, uh, those are the ones that beginners usually focus on and then branch out into more groups. And uh, there are some groups that have very poisonous members. The most notorious is the Amanitas. These are mushrooms that grow on the ground near trees. They share nutrients with the trees. So you're gonna see them mostly in the summer when the trees are active 
when the leaves start falling off the trees, unless uh, it's one that lives with evergreens, you're not going to see amanitas anymore. And in the spring, the trees are just waking up. Uh, there's not a lot of food available for the mushrooms. You usually don't see amanitas in the spring either. Again, with a few exceptions. So they grow near trees on the ground. Um, they have white gills. The gills uh, look sort of like knife edges, and that's where the spores come out. Uh, the amanitas start wrapped in a universal veil, sort of like shrink wrap. And when the mushroom bursts out of this uh, shrink wrap universal veil, there can be patches of the veil left on the top of the mushroom, or uh, they can be around the base of the mushroom, which is often bulbous, looks like a bulb. The gills don't quite connect to the stem. Uh, mycologists call them free from the stem. So if you break the gills from the stem, there's a little space between the gills and the stem. The gills don't tear. Uh, so amanitas have most of these features. Not every one of them has all of the features. But if you see enough of these, you start to recognize amanitas, even if you can't tell which species it is. Although once you know you have an amanita, you can look in a mushroom book or look on a mushroom website and look in the amanita section and then narrow it uh, down. And I had one tour in Prospect Park in Brooklyn. We found uh, tons of amanitas the whole day. Everyone knew easily uh, halfway through the tour, oh, look, another amanita. There's another amanita. And uh, amanitas account for 90% of all mushroom fatalities. And it's a group I tell people, just identify it, but it's not one. Uh, it's not something you want to eat. They're beautiful. They're interesting to identify. I make sculptures modeled after them, but uh, I do not eat them, even though there are some species that you can eat. Are there any clear identification factors that will indicate that a mushroom is poisonous? No. You have to know what the mushroom is, or at least what the genus is. So the, the uh, amanitas, I gave you a bunch of features. If you start seeing uh, three or four of these features, uh, then you can be pretty sure it's an amanita and you leave it alone. There's another group called Cordinarius, also a mushroom that has gills. When it's very young, the gills are covered and protected by a partial veil uh, that uh, looks like a cobweb. And when the cap opens up, the cob pieces of, of what look like cobweb, the, the threads, wind up sticking to the stem. And then they get covered a dark brown, almost black, with spores from the mushroom. So uh, once I've shown people a few Cordinarius species, they are pretty good at recognizing Cordinarius. And what those do is they have a recirculating poison that does slight damage to the kidneys that you wouldn't notice, but it keeps recirculating. And after a month after you eat it, suddenly you go into kidney failure. Uh, so that's another, another group that you want to avoid. Isn't it true also that there are mushrooms that are edible and then a similar looking mushroom that's actually toxic? Isn't that quite common within the mushroom family? Uh, that happens, especially if someone comes from one part of the world and goes to another part of the world. So there are no poisonous lookalikes to the, to the chicken mushroom. Uh, there are other polypores that are uh, edible or bad tasting or tough as wood, uh, but nothing that you could actually bite into that will kill you. So that's a, a safe one. There are meadow mushrooms which grow in meadows and fields, they are related to the store-bought mushroom, and uh, they look somewhat similar to amanitas. So that's not a group for beginners. Uh, what you, uh, easy way to tell those apart, if you cut the cap off of an amanita, um, put it on some newspaper uh, with the gills facing down and cover it with a bowl, white spores will fall out of the cap, and the black newsprint will show you this white powder the next day, 
in the same configuration as the gills. If you do that, uh, this is called a spore print. If you do that with uh, one of the field mushrooms, the relatives of the store-bought mushroom, you will have uh, chocolate brown spores. So you get a chocolate brown spore print, and then you know for sure you don't have an amanita. All amanitas have white spores. When you think about the amanita mushroom and you think about cartoons, quite often the amanita is is used with a lot of cartoons, which I think is kind of interesting because it's something that's toxic, but yet many people that are growing mushrooms will draw something that looks or appears to be an amanita. Yeah, I don't know how that got into the culture, but it's been there for a very, very long time. I know that you're a vegan, but you don't necessarily have to be a vegan to enjoy mushrooms. But since you do consume so many wild edible mushrooms, could you share some of your tips with our listeners? It depends on the quality of the mushrooms. Some mushrooms are great sautéed, and those are the ones that don't have a high water content. Some of them, like a mushroom that comes up in wood chips in people's gardens and on paths in the parks, spring, summer, and fall, especially spring and fall, is the wine cap strafaria. That's a very large mushroom with uh, a reddish, dull reddish uh, cap, a white stem, lilac-colored gills. It grows in wood chips. And at the bottom of the mushroom, uh, you see the mycelium, the body of the fungus going into the wood like uh, thick white threads. And that one has a high water content. So what I do with that one is uh, I put it in a pan with the tiniest amount of a light oil like almond oil or grapeseed oil. I put the heat on uh, low and within a few minutes, liquid exudes from the mushroom. I'll then add some lemon juice, some wine. It is a wine cap after all, fennel and nutmeg and a dash of salt. Those those seem to be the best seasonings for this mushroom. I'm sure there's other schemes that work too. Cover it and let it simmer in its juices for about 15 minutes. Um, all wild mushrooms should be cooked. I have a number of tips for wine cap strafaria, strafaria, Rugoso annulata that I'd like to share. This is a large mushroom with a dull reddish cap, uh, white stem, lilac colored gills, and white rhizomorphs, the fungus uh, that extend into the wood chips, which is its natural habitat. And uh, this is a delicious large mushroom, comes up in great quantity, especially in the spring and in the fall, and sometimes in the summer after there has been tons of rain. And uh, this has a high moisture content. Now, uh, a lot of people want to saute mushrooms. That's good for mushrooms that are um, relatively dry and they will have some moisture in them. But when you uh, saute something, you're using oil, which heats up to about 375 degrees. If lots of water exudes from the mushroom, the water boils at 212 degrees. You cannot get it to 375 degrees. If you turn up the heat, it just boils faster, but it always boils at um, at uh, 212 degrees Fahrenheit. So with this mushroom, you uh, slice it, put it in a, uh, a hot pan with a very slight amount of oil, cook it on low heat. Within a few minutes, lots of liquid is, exudes from the mushroom. And uh, you then add lemon juice, wine, nutmeg, fennel, and a little bit of salt. Cover it and let it simmer covered on low heat in uh, the juices that it, ex- uh, that it produces, plus, of course, the lemon juice and wine, for about 15 minutes. All mushrooms should be cooked thoroughly. Uh, people will get uh, bad reactions in digestion from, from undercooked mushrooms. And all mushrooms have hydrazine, which is a rocket fuel, and it's carcinogenic, but it is destroyed by heat. Uh, so after 15 minutes, you uncover the mushroom, turn the heat on high, 
stir constantly until all the liquid has been uh, absorbed or evaporated, and you have an incredibly delicious mushroom, way better than uh, unsuccessfully trying to saute it. With the chicken mushroom I mentioned before, you just put in chicken recipes, and if you're a vegan like me and you want uh, there to be some protein in it, uh, then uh, to be more filling, you'll add some pasta or rice or other grains in the recipe, and uh, you'll get a main course rather than a uh, side dish. Um, giant puffballs, these are mushrooms uh, that look sort of like soccer balls or beach balls. They are white. Uh, they are tremendous. They grow on the ground in the dirt, uh, not on trees or anything like that. Um, no poisonous lookalikes. That one you uh, slice up and uh, heat uh, some olive oil in a pan until very, very hot, and then just stick the slices in the pan. Uh, you have to do this in successive batches because the mushroom is so big. As soon as it's brown, uh, flip it over, add some salt and pepper or any other seasonings that you happen to like. You can sprinkle on some lemon juice or lime juice too. When the second side is uh, lightly brown, it is done. It um, It's sort of like what tofu would be like if tofu had flavor. Uh, very soft mushroom texture of marshmallow and uh, great flavor. And uh, I've even uh, breaded that mushroom and then cooked it in layers of tomato sauce and vegan cheese and made giant puffball parmesan. Uh, that's another good one. It's basically infinite what you can do with the with the mushrooms. There's one mushroom that comes up um, early spring and late fall and sometimes other times of the year called the mica cap. It's in a, another safe family of mushrooms called the inky caps. Uh, these mushrooms have gills. Uh, they can grow on the ground or in, in uh, uh, wood chip areas. And when they mature, the cap disintegrates or partially disintegrates and turns into, uh, into ink. And if you squeeze it with your thumb, you have ink on your thumb. Uh, this is another generally safe group of mushrooms. There's one mushroom that can sometimes cause a temporary bad reaction uh, if you drink alcohol after eating the mushroom, but that doesn't always happen, and then you recover. Uh, so the mica cap is one of the smaller members of the inky cap group. It has little particles on the cap. If you look very closely, it look like pieces of sand or mica. And uh, you sometimes get that in very large quantities. You have to get it when it's young before it starts turning into ink. Uh, it's considered mediocre in all the mushroom books, but I finally accidentally found one way of making it taste really good. Um, it has a high water content and sort of disintegrates, so tang doesn't really work with it. So I decided to try to bake it. I mixed some olive oil with some um, miso and a bunch of savory spices and put it on a, an oiled cookie sheet in the oven. And where is it going to go? How is it going to get away from me? So then I baked it for about uh, 35, 40 minutes, 350 degrees removed the cookie sheet, and lo and behold, the mushroom had melted down into a black sludge on the cookie sheet. All right, another failure. At least I tried. So I took a spatula and started scraping the uh, residue off of the cookie sheet so I could throw it away and clean the cookie sheet. But then I decided to taste the residue, and lo and behold, it was an incredibly delicious-tasting black mushroom spread. So now whenever I find enough of these mushrooms and they haven't started turning into ink yet, I make some kind of a recipe with uh, oil and spices and let it melt down into a sludge, and I've got a wonderful mushroom dip. So it really depends on what mushroom you have. Each mushroom has its own culinary properties, which is one of the things if you like to cook like me, makes uh, these mushrooms really interesting and fun and tasty and nutritious. Thank you, Steve. Steve, we are out of time. Could you take a moment and just share your website with our listeners? Sure. The website is wildmansteverill.com. And as always, June, it's a pleasure being on your show. Thank you so much for inviting me. 
Oh, you're very welcome. And folks, please check out the companion article, which will be available on theorganicview.com. Thank you for tuning in. This has been June Stoyer with the Organic View Radio Show. Have a great afternoon.